This is Duke University. Global trade and environmental the justice. Human rights China issues today. are still. The term Ubuntu. A the alien and sedition accident. Is making inferential discoveries. The importance of an archive. The John Ho Franklin Center. For more than 20 years, Bakari Kitwana has been on the cutting edge of discussions about hip hop and politics. Bakari Kitwana joins us this afternoon on Left of Black to talk about his new national tour, Rap Sessions, discussing the black image in the white American imagination. And later we're joined by Professor Kira Gaunt, Professor of Sociology and Anthropology at Baruch College in New York City, who talks about the Twitter revolution. I'm Mark Anthony Neal, and this is Left of Black. Good afternoon, you're watching Left to Black. I'm Mark Anthony Neal, and we're here this afternoon with the guests. Bakari Kitwana, who's coming to us from his home in the suburbs of Cleveland, Ohio. How are you doing, Bakari? I'm good. Bakari Kitwana, if you don't know him, is the former executive editor of The Source magazine, editor, former editorial director of Third World Press, author most known for his books, The Hip Hop Generation 2002, and the provocatively titled, Why White Kids Love Hip Hop 2005. Bakari is also a co-founder of the National Hip Hop Political Convention. He's currently now an editor at large at newsone.com and also the CEO of Rap Sessions. How you doing this afternoon, Bakari? I'm great. How's the weather in Cleveland? I know y'all been hit with a bunch of snow. <laughs> no, it's, it's the usual. It's not bad. It's actually 40 degrees today. I want to start and talk to you a little bit about Rap Sessions. Um, this is a national tour that you started about five years ago. Um, something that came out of your work with the National Hip Hop Political Convention about bringing together groups of thinkers, activists, um, scholars, journalists, uh, artists themselves to talk about some of the difficult questions that really come up when we think about the coalition of folks who have long supported hip hop. Um, while we think about it as a very multicultural brand, there are difficult conversations that you felt needed to occur within the context of this community of folks that, that coalesced around hip hop. Uh, talk a little bit about your ideas behind Rap Sessions. Rap Sessions grew out of the 2004 National Hip Hop Political Convention. Um, Myself and about 12 other activists from around the country, people like Davy D, Raz Baraka, Baye Adolfo, Wilson, uh, Rosa Clemente, uh, Alexis McGill, now Alexis McGill Johnson, um, and, and others. We came together in Chicago at Third World Press. Basically, we wanted to create a platform to begin to bring the, a political agenda to people born in what we call the hip-hop generation. Um, really, our generation assuming the mantle of leadership uh, to move us on into the next century. And so we, we had this, uh, we, we ended up bringing about 5,000 young people to Newark in the summer of 2004. It was the first uh, National Hip Hop Political Convention. Uh, around the same time, Russell Simmons had uh, launched and brought to the fore the Hip Hop Summit Action Network. Around the same time, Billy Wimsett had launched the uh, League of Young Voters. Mm -hmm. um, and, and other efforts came came after that. The Hip Hop Congress was 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 beginning to thrive at a national level, and so basically we had the convention. We brought about five thousand young people to Newark. Actually, more younger people came uh, than people on the older end of what we call the hip hop generation. Uh, but one of the things that was clear was that the decimation of public schools was having a serious impact on young people's uh, ability to understand the process of civic engagement. And so we saw very early, like basic, uh, basic uh, things about how government worked, um, even something as simple as parliamentary procedures, that many young people were not familiar with these. What we also saw was that it was very difficult, even though young people across race and gender were gravitating to the music, it was very, very difficult to make that leap to um, uh, political movement um, without dealing with some issues like gender and race. And how do you work across these racial divides? How do you work across the gender divides? And so that's basically what the, the Rap Sessions model uh, was meant to do, was after the convention, we began to go around the country to have these dialogues with the hope that by 2008, young people would be in a better position to, to be prepared to, to participate in electoral politics. You're watching Left to Black. I'm Mark Anthony Neal. We're here with Bakari Kitwana. 
uh, longtime activist, former editor with The Source magazine, former editorial director of Third World Press, and of course, most well known for the very influential and, and groundbreaking text, The Hip Hop Generation 2002 and, and Why Kids, White Kids Love Hip Hop 2005. You're about to go on tour again with Rap Sessions. What's the theme of, of this year's national tour? The new tour, uh, this is going to be, I think, our six. I'm beginning to lose track. We did the first <laughs> tour in 05. We continued it in 06. Um, but 05 was the first year, and we did race and hip hop. 06, we did, uh, uh, the, um, boy, oh, we did oh, we did race and hip hop again. 07 was the tour that you were on, hip which was agenda. Does hip hop uh, hate uh, women? Does hip hop hate women? Yeah. And we did 15 cities with that one. We did, after that, we did uh, hip hop in the presidential election. Um, then we did uh, Is America Really Post-Racial in 09. Last year we did Global Hip Hop and Economic Recovery. This year the focus is From Precious to For Colored Girls, The Black Image and the American Mind. And what are the things you're hoping to, to achieve with this year's tour? I mean, how many, who are some of the folks that are going out with you? Well, you are. <laughs> I hope. Um, really, I mean, this tour came out of a conversation I had with you. Uh, and Joan, you guys at the time Joan were, Morgan, you, right? The Joan author. Morgan, I'm sorry. You guys were putting the book together uh, on in response to the film Precious, uh, and so you know we were thinking this would be a good time if the book was coming out at the same time we could launch this tour and engage people in the conversation. Um, after that, you know, with someone thinking about what was going on in the country, really in terms of ra in, in terms of race. What was happening in the country in the aftermath of the election of Barack Obama? Uh, most certainly, I think, in terms of our media, black folks have taken a serious hit, not only because of the decline of uh, journalism as we once knew it, but also because of the ways in which we are talked about and presented in national culture. In many ways, it's very reminiscent of the 80s. Um, and, and so, like, how do, you, how do you deal with that? And I think one of the ways you deal with that, one of the things that Rap Sessions has tried to be is to try to get people to go back to the community discussions that we used to have yeah. that empowered us. We, began, we have ideas about what we think about is going on in our communities and across the country, but a lot of times we, we're doing it in isolation. So having these conversations gives us another opportunity to have an outlet where we can come together outside of the context of national media that's trying to really shape and define where we're going with these ideas. So we want to focus on what is the image and perception of black folks right now in America after two years of having a black president. And I mean, the backlash I think has been tremendous. And so it's a lot to talk about. We're on Left of Black. I'm Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined by Bakari Kitwana, a longtime activist and author, talking to us from his home outside of Cleveland, Ohio. I, I want to stay with the media piece for a second, Bakari. Um, one of the things that's been interesting, we've talked a little bit about, you know, the media coverage post um, the shooting of, of Gabri um, Giffords in, in Arizona and the other folks that were killed and wounded there. And you know, the, the thing that's so striking about this, and, and, and I think about the memorial service that they had out in Arizona uh, that the president spoke at, and immediately how the very mainstream, or, or, or what one of my colleagues called the lamestream media, <laughs> you know, gave a certain kind of portrait um, of the events that somehow involving Native American um, spirituality into the mix and, and the kind of rousing, almost uh, revival-like presence that, that Barack Obama had in his own comments, that somehow they didn't fit what should have occurred, right? And, and what it really brought was kind of a fault line around what's happening culturally. You have been involved throughout your career in what we would call independent media, uh, whether it's working with Hakeem Abudi at Third World Press, um, working with the Source magazine. Can you talk a little bit about where we are in terms of corporate media and independent media? I, I mean, to give you some context for this, I mean, when folks ask me about a show like Left to Black um, and the rationale for it, I mean, what I tell folks is that, you know, when the media is not responsive to the needs of your community, you become the media yourself. Um, talk a little bit about why that's important in, in this yeah. particular historical moment. Man, we're in a, I think we're in a really dangerous place in terms of media. I think the influence of media um, has always been tremendous in terms of its ability to shape image. But I think that the overlap between uh, media and, and corporate uh, business um, has reached a, a, an all-time low or high, depending <laughs> on, on your perspective. 
And so I think that we're in a real dangerous place. I mean, I think the overlap, I mean, you take something like Fox News, for example, um, you take something, a person like Sarah Palin or Newt Gingrich, for example, and their contracts that they have with Fox Mike Huckabee, sometimes right. doesn't allow them to be to appear on other on other uh, on other networks. Right. Uh, and so it's like, so what's going to happen during the presidential campaign? <laughs> They're only going. Are they going to only be able to be interviewed by Fox News only, and other journalists won't get a chance to to engage them? So I mean, I think questions like this. Um, make the independent media um, very, very necessary. And it's, I think it's forcing people to rethink so much what they're hearing because one of the things that's really broken down is the facts. The facts are just not always present. We saw this a lot with um, a lot of the campaign uh, advertising um, uh, during, during the election 2010, the midterms. Uh, and I think we're going to see it even worse as we see the continuing escalation of uh, the redefining by the Supreme Court of corporations as individuals. Right, right, right. <laughs> This is very, very serious. Right. Um, and the backlash that Obama has, has received um, in attempting to make government work on behalf of the people uh, is something that I never would have imagined that I would see uh, in, in my lifetime. And so I think we're in a real dangerous place. I think people are gonna have to step up their skills their media literacy skills. Mm. People are going to mm. have to step up their ability mm. to look for alternative news sources and to check out the news sources that they're that they're uh, that they're even reading. One of the most important books that I've read in a very long time is the Ishmael Reed uh, uh, book, uh, Barack Obama and the Jim Crow Media. Yes, it's 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 an excellent excellent book that really begins to take you deep into uh, an understanding of the relationship between these talking heads that you're hearing. And who's putting money in their pocket? Right, right. <laughs> and it's, and it's, it's, it's very, very serious. And the ways in which the monolithic message, I think that the election of Barack Obama was good for the country in terms of our understanding of media, because you see out of sync the, the, the public opinion polls and then what these talking heads are saying on TV. A lot of times the facts are not present. I mean, Fox News has perfected the art of this, but we're seeing it across media and the assault on black folks is incredible. I did this piece, um, Mark, that I talked to you about, um, Terry Gross. Um, Talking about Jay-Z, right. Should, yeah, should Terry Gross go the way of uh, Juan Williams, Williams yeah. was the title of the piece. And essentially what I was saying, I mean, and, and, and uh, Ishmael Reed makes this point in the book as well, is that the so-called progressives are attacking uh, the black image uh, in much the same way that conservatives that are, right? It, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Uh, you asked me a question earlier I didn't answer. The other people on the tour, is, is, is yourself, Joan Morgan, Vijay Prashad, uh, the professor of international studies at Trinity College, um, John Jennings, who's a professor of visual studies at the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. Um, I'm trying to think of who else we got with us on this. Oh, Elizabeth Mendes Berry, mm -hmm. who uh, is the journalist out of New York, um, who uh, is an adjunct professor, and she also was uh, referenced uh, by Jay Z in uh, the book Decoded as the influence uh, and impact on uh, on, on his, on, uh, right, his thought songs. process. Yeah, public, uh, public service announcement. We're here with Bakari Kitwan, a longtime activist, author of the books The Hip Hop Generation and Why White Kids Love Hip Hop, uh, former editor of The Source magazine and executive editor uh, at Third World Press. I, I want to stay on Jay-Z a little bit here. Um, it, it's been fascinating to find, to see his transcendence, um, his development over the last couple of years. Um, one of the things when you talk about media access, I mean, he has gotten a great amount of press um, in recent months because of his book, Decoded, um, sitting down, you know, talking with Oprah on her new network. You mentioned Terry Gross, a very public conversation with Cornel West at the New York Public Library. Another pretty amazing, you know, uh, public discussion with Charlie Rose at the Brooklyn uh, Museum. And, you know, you have some thoughts about Jay-Z. You, you had a chance yourself to sit down and spend some time with Jay-Z a little earlier in his career. I mean, around the time that the Blueprint came out or, or the Black Album when he's beginning this kind of transition. And, and I think about a question that, I, that our good friend Adam Mansbach raised about Jay-Z's access. That, you know, at some point, you know, at this point, he's really more accessible in his career to mainstream media than he's ever been. And, and, and it's part of that simply because 
folks are just really caught up in the story of Jay-Z that they're not really going to ask him the hard, difficult questions about what kind of responsibility he has in terms of the work that he's already created and the groundwork that he's laid and what kind of expectations we should have of, of an adult Sean Carter, you know, worth how many millions of dollars going forward. Right. Well, those are all big questions. I mean, I, I think a part of the problem with the um, the interrogation of Jay Z that you're calling for is the is the interviewer. Yeah. Um, I think we saw this problem early on with hip hop literature, hip hop production, commentary on hip hop from the in, in the book form. Oftentimes, there were not people uh, adequate in the in uh, who knew the range of the material who are being asked to write the reviews. So you get these reviews in the Washington Post or the New York Times right. on hip hop books, passing over people who are, who are familiar with the work and, and who have done the and, research. And this is critical, Bukhari, because right, it's not necessarily, it's not a black white question, right? It, it's about no, folks who have access to hip hop culture and have been immersed in it and, and thus, you know, can really talk about it in ways that are knowledgeable. And, and, and it, again, when you talk about the mainstream media piece, too often the people who are best positioned um, you know, to end up doing these kinds of interviews are not those folks who have, have been immersed in hip hop enough to be able to ask relevant questions. Right. And so, I mean, I think that, that's a, I think that's a part of the problem that we see, we saw with the recent uh, uh, the commentary around uh, the, the Jay-Z book. But I think that um, beyond that, I think that it's um, Jay-Z is a complex character. I think that he has a lot to offer. I think he's at a unique point in his career. I think hip hop is at a unique point point in its career. And so I think this is the first time that we have someone um, of, a, of this kind of senior statesman mm -hmm. yeah. uh, level who's, a, who's not only an artist, <laughs> right. but who is also a theorist. Right. And this is very important because a lot of times we, we don't make this distinction between the artist and the theorist. I think Chuck D, KRS-One, these are hip hop artists who are also theorists. Jay-Z right. is a hip hop artist who's a theorist. So his ability to go in deep um, as he talks about the music and how it overlaps with what happened to us who came of age in the 80s and right. 90s right. And, and how the influence of the civil rights and the black power movements on us as a younger generation is beyond uh, some folks who are just artists. Yeah. So I think that, that, that yeah, I think it's a, it's a unique thing. I also, I'm interested to see where, um, I like the way that Jay-Z looks at what's going on around him and begins to very carefully craft uh, where he's going. So I think that the emergence of the Oprah Winfrey uh, television yeah. uh, channel, I mean, hey, imagine a Jay-Z television channel. Like, right, what, right. what's that going to look like? <laughs> right. And one thing that's also, I think, very important about him is his ability to empower, uh, his not only his ability, but his willingness to empower his own people to tell his story or to tell our story. So, I mean, I think unlike some of the other uh, folks that we've seen that's gotten to this level of financial success, I think he is very uh, much has his mind on uh, black culture uh, and black people and, and, and how is that story best told as someone coming from uh, where he came from and the ability to continuously tell his own story and not have the corporate influences and the other influences try to take that story uh, in, in a different direction. Let me ask you one more question, Bakari. Um, you've talked in the past about, you know, when the hip hop generation came out and you're given a talk in Chicago um, and a young state senator um, is sitting there in the audience and, and, <laughs> and, and walks up to you and introduces himself as Barack Obama. Right. Um, and, and he at the time understood there was some importance to be in the audience, to hear this conversation, to, to wrap his head around what exactly this was phenomenon right. was. And, and of course, he deployed you know, hip hop strategically throughout the 2008 election in ways in which he could push back against, say, uh, sagging pants, but also utilize folks like Jay-Z and Mary J. Blige and, 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 and a range of other folks to serve as almost spokespersons for him you know, in the places that he, was, you know, he wasn't able to go for whatever reasons. Do you think he will be as willing to reach out to hip hop or even more so with the 2012 election? I think, yeah, because I think that people misunderstood what was going on. Barack Obama used, quote unquote, hip hop as a political as a as a tool for a campaign. Yeah. He didn't. And, and after the campaign was over, then he didn't he didn't need it anymore. 
So I think that he perfected the art of using hip hop as a tool in a campaign to get elected. What we expected or what we or what many people thought was going to happen was that was going to somehow make us a reliable uh, base yeah, yeah, once he yeah. was in office. That didn't happen. Now, I think that the fallback of that will be what can he use hip hop again as a tool for mobilizing young people um, against the backdrop of having not um, uh, uh, fought for young people's issues and brought them into the process. Now he has fought for the issues because as a as someone running as a as a politician and using hip hop as a campaign, he made promises to that constituency and he kept those promises. Right. Um, people don't want to deal with that. <laughs> That's another question. And 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 to, to clarify, um, the, the Barack Obama was running for state senate at the time. And there was this uh, woman who was who had invited me to speak at the um, Chicago Historical Society, okay. and she um, she she brought me in for this lecture. It was actually a Martin Luther King Day. I can't remember what, what year it was at this point, but um, it was a Martin Luther King Day. She asked me to come speak, and um, I didn't know him at that point. And before the lecture began, she said, "Hey, I want to bring someone up on stage." Who's a dear friend of mine? Who's running for office? And and you know we were talking. The, the conversation was about uh, from Harold Washington to hip hop. Yeah, that was my that was my topic. We've been joined by Bakari Kitwana, longtime activist, author of the Hip Hop Generation and Why White Kids Love Hip Hop, former executive editor at the groundbreaking magazine The Source, and of course uh, editorial director at Third World Press. Thanks for joining us, Bakari. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to seeing you out on the road on Rap Sessions shortly. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Take care. Social media are becoming increasingly important in reporting the news in general. Uh, in a situation like Egypt where you have things that are happening you know, now, uh, a new social medium like Twitter can actually uh, get information out faster than any other medium of communication. For example, if the fighting starts out between the pro-government and anti-government forces in Cairo, people can tweet somebody and let them know that people on the other side of the square you know, are, are, are fighting or whatever. And then uh, journalists also t tweet back and forth too to keep up with information from the scene that they may not be able to be at at that time. Uh, information research uh, says that uh, the use by journalists of tweets has increased by 80% in the last year, whereas three or four years ago it wasn't even a tool of reporting. All the social media that we have now, Facebook for example, um, major new forms of communication technology, very valuable in reporting this and other crisis situations around the world in Tunisia too. I think it shows how much social media plays a role in anything, certainly the political geo nature of this conflict, um, in the world. I mean, the fact that they felt the need to turn off the internet speaks volumes in itself. It's what I think was compelling the young people to get out in the street. I heard a statistic the other day that I really couldn't believe that in, in that country, over 60% um, 60 of, 60 of the population are under the age of 25. And of that population, almost a quarter of those people unemployed. They got plenty of time to look at Facebook and other social media and Twitter. So it also shows an impact because the government has decided as of, I believe, Wednesday to turn it back on. So um, I think we'll see an impact. Um, I'm hoping that this will have a positive impact perhaps on the country of Iran and see how those young people might perhaps take to the streets again. You're watching Left to Black. I'm Mark Anthony Neal and we're here now with Professor Kira D. Gaunt, Associate Professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Baruch College in New York City. How are you doing this afternoon, Kira? Doing really well. Glad to be here. Kira is also the author of the groundbreaking book, Black Girls Play, Learning the Ropes from Double Dutch to Hip Hop, New York University Press, 2007. She was also a 2009 TED Fellow, TED being Technology, Entertainment, and Design. And you're also a vocalist, uh, released your CD, Be True, Be the True Revolution, a few years ago. And so again, we're so happy to have you on Left to Black. Thank you. This afternoon, though, I, I want to talk a little bit. It's, we're taping this on February the 1st. Um, 
a very historical date. Uh, 51 years ago, uh, the Greensboro Four, Woolworth Counter in Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, a moment that's very often seen as kind of setting off uh, the civil rights movement after it had been dormant a few years after the great uh, successes in Montgomery. One of the features of that moment was that immediately these young men sit at a lunch counter and they do their sit-in. They go back the next day and the day after and, and the movement goes viral. And, and very often when we hear the term viral, we think about social media uh, and yeah. particularly uh, Facebook and Twitter in this particular moment. And you wrote a, a great piece last week about the impact of social media in our conversations now, uh, about this idea that Twitter is allowing us to deal in, in very interesting and, 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 and non-conventional ways, I think, ultimately, uh, with the new Jim Crow. Yeah, um, I'm reading Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, uh, Mass Incarceration in the time of colorblindness and uh, as I prepare for my racism class this semester. And um, it just occurred to me when the conviction of Kelly williams Bolar became uh, present to me on January 25th, coincidentally the same day as all of these uprisings in yeah. Egypt, that I, um, something happened actually um, that I didn't really blog about, which was um, I tweeted, I wrote the blog immediately. I've been practicing, you know, writing blogs in the morning and getting them online uh, in the same couple of hours. And uh, people were responding to it, especially black folks were responding to it with a lot of emotion, but there were no retweets. Nobody was yeah. sharing the information yeah. further. And for a second, I thought, wow, we have this amazing tool. And our first thought is always kind of reacting to the grapevine as opposed to sharing and reacting. And it wasn't that they didn't do that eventually. It just occurred to me that I don't think we realize the power that we have mm -hmm. that we didn't have before Twitter. Um, I was on NPR yesterday and I said that, uh, you know, before Twitter, we just talked about that there were no black people on Friends. <laughs> and that's all we talked about. And nobody, nobody wrote in to NBC about that. You know, the days of the Bill Cosby show were a long gone. Yeah. That day of that kind of a sitcom as it, that also has drama in it has been long gone for black folks on TV, at least on the major networks. And we just had the only the ability to complain, to right. vent. Right. Now we have the ability to not only complain and vent, but to do it in a productive manner. Because all of those folks, the producers and, and the folks who green light exactly. stuff are on Twitter also, right? We exactly. have access to them in ways that we never had before. Your senators are on Twitter. Right. So, you know, my senator is, and I can reach out to her. I can reach out to people who are in my neighborhood, and I can reach out to people who I've never met. Like I was saying in my post that we black faculty, there's so few of us in the U.S. professorate. Right, you mentioned 3%, right? <laughs> you know, we're less than 3%, and I think people need to be reminded of how few of us there are, and mostly we're not at the same institutions. So we rarely get to connect, but yeah. now I get to connect with you like basically every day. <laughs> You're watching Left to Black. We're on here with Kira Gaunt talking about uh, the new Jim Crow and the impact of social media and Twitter. Uh, talk a little bit uh, about this uh, Kelly Williams Bolar case. Um, you know, for f audience members who aren't familiar, a black woman uh, who is dealing with the challenges of raising two daughters, you know, by herself and trying to find the right school district and, and tried to establish a dual residency so she'd be able to send her children uh, to a better school. And, and, and eventually, you know, things kind of go awry. Uh, talk a little bit about the case. Yeah, she I was looking at the video again of her, you know, one interview. She's been very reluctant. She's kind of a uh, been overwhelmed by the media attention she's gotten so far. She didn't expect any of this to um, come about. When the judge convicted her, she was convicted by an Ohio judge of, of two consecutive five-year sentences yeah, <laughs> for the choice of what she claimed, and she claimed from her cell, cell um, in jail that she was in there for nine days out of her 10 days that she eventually got. The judge lowered the sentence to 10 days in jail three years of probation and 80, 80 hours of community service. She said she actually was maintaining dual um, residence with her father, her, the, the, her children's grandfather's home. 
Um, and it had a lot to do with it. Uh, a year before she sent the girls to the school that they were going to, there was a robbery in her home and subsidized housing. Mm -hmm. And she knew she had to do something to get her kids out of there. And as one, um, there's been a lot of really great media in the last couple of days online. Um, someone who works with one of the school system associations in, in Ohio said that, you know, there's a hun there's a hundred percent correlation to your zip code and the effectiveness of what you get out of schooling. Yeah. And so if yeah. you don't land yourself in the right zip code, you're not going to get the best schooling. You know, the thing that's so amazing about this story, I mean, there, there are hundreds of thousands of parents who make these kind of choices yep. every year, whether to get into better schooling or you have a, a particularly skilled athlete and you want to yep. make sure that kid can play on the right team and be with the right coaches and get the right kind of instruction. But yet this particular woman is singled out um, and, and essentially criminalized you know, for wanting and desiring to have a better life for her girls. Do you think it's accidental that she just happens to be a black woman? No, it's not accidental. That, that's a, a very classic case of structural embedded um, inequities, mm -hmm. what we call structural mm -hmm. racism. Mm -hmm. um, she is the personal face of it, but mm -hmm. there are um, hundreds and thousands of other mothers of color who would make that choice if they had a relative who lived in a better neighborhood. Right. Um, in the state of New York and New Jersey, it's legal, even though it's still frowned upon. Right. Um, in the state of Ohio, you know, uh, the, the administrators at the school that uh, she was, the, that her children were attending said that, you know, she needs to pay us back. The, this money is for our children. children right. And I think that that's, that's the problem with where we are, is that if I don't see your children as my children, right. in this whole conversation about reforming education, we have a serious right. problem because that means the people on the bottom of the rung will be left behind. That if, I, if I don't see public education as a right as opposed to a privilege, right? Exactly. That's right. And a certain you know, privilege for a certain group of folks, yeah. We already have a 66% dropout rate on the high school level and a 44% dropout rate on the higher ed level. And those people are disproportionately black and Latino. They're not necessarily Asian and white. And so we, we can't say that it's her. And, and by this very same token, you know, people make um, poor choices when the structure mm -hmm. is set against them. Right. So a lot of people are like, well, she broke the law. What's wrong with, uh, you know, if you break the law, you do the time. Well, this punishment is not consistent with this crime. And That's of course, she was convicted of two felonies, right? Which, she, of course, uh, you know, put her in a context where she would also have to suffer in terms of not being able to be hired in, in a job in the school district, right? She works in a public school system. The public school system has said that the governor has no say over whether she keeps her job or not, yeah. but clearly she's been suspended, she's been in jail. Right. They say they're gonna give her her job back eventually, <laughs> but the problem is um, her father has also been convicted of uh, $30,000 theft as a felon. Wow. So the whole family is a felon. Those wow. two kids are gonna be impacted by that for years to come, right. and nobody's talking about the children. Yeah. Nobody, I haven't heard, I haven't seen anything in any written report, any newspaper about the impact this has on kids or to not single her out. Clearly there are other cases around the country. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen any journalism about that. All right. You're watching Left to Black. I'm Mark Anthony Neal. We're here with Professor Kira Gaunt of Baruch College in New York City. Uh, you mentioned in your piece uh, research that comes from the Edison Research uh, Company about uh, the number of black folks, and disproportionately, 24% of the population on Twitter happens to be African American. And, and there have been a lot of articles over the last six or seven months about the way uh, black folks are tweeting their time away, <laughs> if you will, or, or twittering their time away in, yeah. in, in unproductive work. Um, but in, is concerned about what we do with our free time. <laughs> right, right, you know, real, <laughs> real housewives of Atlanta, you know, we're, we're, exactly. we're, we're tweeting about the game, you know, we're tweeting about Drake and, and Nicki Minaj. Um, but you say in your piece that in fact, when you first came to Twitter um, and you began to see the power of it, uh, it felt like change to you. 
Yeah. And, and, and what do you say to folks? Because, you know, neither one of us, right, we're, we're not part of that 18 to 25 set that, it, that we think is being locked into social media, you know, in the kind of parlance of the day, you are a grown ass woman. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and so what do you say to folks who, who look at the work that you do and, and, you know, raise this critique? What are you doing wasting your time on Twitter? You know, I um, first I want to say about the Edison research um, that, you know, you can label ever since that research came out in April of 2010, people have been talking about a hashtag called Black Twitter. Um, <laughs> It's hard to say what black Twitter is yeah. for most people who are looking at Twitter from the outside in. But I can tell you just a little synopsis of what I would call black Twitter from being in the inside, both as an ethnographer, but also as just a regular digital native to the <laughs> territory. Um, black Twitter, Twitter, there was an example. This is what began to hook me. In June of 2009, there was a hashtag stream called That's African. And it was started by African immigrants talking about moving into American culture. Okay. And there was a tweet like, you know, that's African when your mother goes to um, Foot Locker and, you know, negotiates the price. Oh, <laughs> there was an oh after. <laughs> African Americans who were born and raised in the States would see that that's African, maybe even without reading the tweet fully, and think, well, that's about me. I'm African. So they started writing what might be considered the hashtag that's ghetto. Right, right. <laughs> and it was all in fun and in jest. It wasn't meant to be, it was, it might be perceived as stereotypical. But this happened from like 7.30 to 9.30 p.m. on one night. And I watched that whole two hours. Yes, I wasted my time, some people might say, tweeting, watching, listening. This is like great ethnography. It's yeah, like right. research for me. <laughs> right. And then at 9.30, white folks got on and saw That's African. And so they probably were watching all along, but they decided to get into the conversation. And they said, that's racist. And within seconds, when that started to stream, it got cut. All, most of us who were in that stream were clear that Twitter turned off. It was trending on Twitter. It was right. trending at six, at right. five, at four, and it got to three, and then the, that's African became that's racist, and it got cut off. Got and shut down. Post right. on Huffington Post about it, and, and it was by somebody who had you know dipped into the stream for a second, really hadn't listened, and I would say that's a great example of what black Twitter really is, because in that moment, I connected with a guy in the outskirts of London named Matt Platts. He's a young, progressive, um, uh, he has, he's either uh, biracial or gay, I have no idea, we've talked a bit about it, but I can't like name it. Mm -hmm. He has been running for office in, in his local, you know, principality, and he got on Twitter in that moment and said, I thought it was wrong that they said that that was African, that that's racist. Right. Now, that's never, I can't even get some of my white colleagues to stand up for me like that. <laughs> <laughs> and definitely not, you know, people in small mixed race settings that are informal. Yeah. It's so taboo here. So now black, black Twitter is not about the United States. It's much right. broader. broader. Right. It's bigger than just agrarian rooted Southern African Americans. It's people who uh, I know white Africans from South Africa and Kenya. I know Indian Africans right. who participate. They could right. be considered part of black Twitter. That's just not what the Edison research group is studying. Yeah, it, we've got to, we've got to separate those two things. It, it's not static, right? I mean, that's the thing. It, it's something that's always malleable and moving and, and, yes. and, and emerging. It, it's, I mean, that's kind of the beauty of, of Twitter, right? Our ability to really travel in all of these different communities, yeah. um, you know, while sitting in front of our, you know, either our Blackberries or our laptops, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that, um, you know, I always say I do a workshop on Twitter called um, Don't Talk to, uh, How to Fail at Twitter. Don't talk to strangers. <laughs> and in it, I say, you know, for most people, some people see Twitter as a business networking right. um, agent. And, but it's not a seller's market. It's a sharer's market. Right, right, right. And by the same token, it's not simply 18 to 24-year-olds. Actually, the, the largest growing, the fastest people growing on Twitter 
are 30 to 50 year old women yeah. of all ethnicities. Um, so it's not right. The, the so-called women. digital immigrants, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, and you know, I love the guilty pleasure of shows like The Game. If I had TV, I'd probably be watching it. <laughs> I'm curious about what's happened to BET. You know, yeah. we lost black ownership of BET. It started to look like another MTV. Yeah. And now they adopted a program that black people voiced their concern about right. Right. and brought it back on. Right. And I think that that's, you know, that's been influenced by social media, particularly by Twitter. I mean, that was, that was the thing that was really, you know, fascinating about when the game came back on and it, it sets these records, not only just for BET, you know, but for the kind of scripted series that it was. I mean, it, it, it was record breaking. And, and part of the dynamic of that was how BET wisely understood the value of the brand and marketed to, to, to black folks and how black folks created this support base for it on Twitter. I, I mean, literally, there, there had to be about a million black folks on Twitter communally watching the first episode and tweeting about it. And I mean, I can't think of any other instances where black folks can congregate the way that we have in such extraordinary numbers, whether it's the death of Michael Jackson, yep. you know, whether it's the game or, or any range of things. I mean, it's, it's really unprecedented, you know, in, in terms of our ability to come together in this way. Very reminiscent, of, I think, of black radio doing the civil rights movement in, yeah. in that regard. You know, and I think um, in this time and age, we need it for two reasons. We need it because we have been so censored and policed about our collective communication mm -hmm. and expressiveness. But we also need it because it's time for an electron leap. It's time to really break out of the mold of what it means to be black in whatever way you were taught that that meant. In this, in the timeline, you just can't be same old, same old black. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you know, I have students who are in undergrad and grad who like they can reach out and chat with me and I have people who don't even know anything about double dutch and hip-hop who interact <laughs> with me both in negative ways you know I got I caught some flaming stuff both on Facebook and Twitter about posting videos on white privilege yeah, yeah. from you know white conservative folks but there was this one guy his name is like Freetown Brown I mean he cussed me out through Twitter and I was like, OK, can't you just agree to be offended and stay connected? It's not my video. I didn't. I'm just right, I'm the messenger. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and we got three days later, he came back and he said, you know what? I think I was a little harsh with you in a tweet. <laughs> then I said, you know, thank you. I didn't take it personally. And then he said, you know, have you ever listened to X, Y and Z music? I had never heard of who it was. Right. But I watched the video on YouTube that he sent me. And I was like, that reminds me of Laurie Anderson, you know, this art. Nouveau right, right, artist right. that I love. I sent him a tweet. He didn't know about it. We've been friends ever since. Right, and that's the power. That's part of the powers of social media. Yeah. Uh, well, Every now and again, he tweets me just to check in on. <laughs> We're watching Left to Black. I'm Mark Anthony Neal. We're here with Professor Kira Gaunt. Uh, lastly, I want to talk a little bit about the stuff that we're beginning to watch and, and really fascinated with in uh, Tunisia and, and, of course, Egypt. And in particular, the, 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 the way that social media has been used, right, to, to spread the message of what's happening on the ground, to, to develop collaborations, right, across region around this dynamic. Are you at, at all surprised at the way that social media has played such a critical role um, as, as citizens in these two countries, and, and, and I imagine other countries very soon, are beginning to push back against their governments using, you know, social media? Yeah, no, not at all, because I remember the first few months that I was on Twitter, I learned about that massive earthquake in Japan long mm -hmm. before the media did. Mm -hmm. So I've been watching conversations on Twitter about Egypt for about a year now. And those conversations were that people used to disappear. The police would just take you. You'd be caught up in something and they'd take you away and your family and friends would know where they took you until Twitter came along. They would tweet as they were in the back of the police car. Right. They're taking me X, Y, and Z place. Right. And their people would be able to find them. So this has been, you know, maybe a year from now, um, uh, the head of Facebook won't be on the cover of Time magazine. Twitter will be. <laughs> because it really, I mean, the whole Middle East, Sudan, this is like unraveling all of these oppressive, you know, states where people have decided 
you know, you know what? I'm. I just had an epiphany. Like, we need to learn in this so-called democracy what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Because women, children, all classes, all ages are coming out and saying, "No more Mubarak, no more." And we don't do that with TV shows. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, get with the program. <laughs> Want to take us back to the system? Get with the program. <laughs> <laughs> You've been watching Left of Black. We're here at Kira D. Gaunt, who is the author of the 2007 book, Black Girls Play, Learning the Ropes from Double Dutch to Hip Hop. That's New York University Press. She's associate professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Baruch College and 2009 TED Fellow. That's Technology, Entertainment, and Design. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, Kira. Well, can I do a little pitch? Yes, of course. I'm going to Norway for two weeks. I'm gonna be um, going on a field work excursion and my students are going to be interacting with me through social media back here in new york city oh that's great that's and easy. so you know the power of social media is that we can really take our students places they can't afford to go right now right empowering and we, us in the classroom in ways that you know that that we hadn't thought about yeah and it, and it came out of a twitter you know, <laughs> <something>. so <laughs> thank you kira take care you're welcome thank you bye bye, -bye. by Duke University, online at duke.edu.